and that was great. But at some point in the early 90s, he decided to take his musical therapy sessions, he decided to take them public, and he chose me as an architect. So that was my first project. I started my career in the entertainment industry, and some say that this club, uh, behind which the entertainer is, is very central, he's my hero. Uh, they say that this guy changed the face of Beirut nightlife in the early post-war years. And I think it's a political act, I think it's a cultural act. Uh, I think the culture is not just in museums, I think that sometimes museums very often are the cemeteries of culture. So you can find culture at your local barber shop, in your nightclub, and I'm a firm believer of that. So my first project was a nightclub that uh, some people say changed the face of the Beirut nightlife. You see, this is the kind of pictures that started, uh, that Beirut started exporting in the 90s, lots of them. And I was part of that. You see, I'm, I'm right there, I had long hair. Not on the pole, I'm not a transvestite. No? Uh, that was me with the long hair. Back in the early mid-90s when we started the, that club. To start the club, we had to find a piece of land. We, we, we didn't have much money, so we couldn't purchase a piece of land. We had to rent a piece of land, and we, we very, very carefully chose a piece of land that was located in the quarantine, the Carantina, which is very close to the center, but is a doomed area because it has a very difficult pass. And uh, because we were looking for a piece of land in Carantina, I was told that the, per the, per the perfect uh, place to go to was the, was the church, because the church is the biggest landowner in Lebanon, and they own a lot of land in Carantina. Now, Carantina is a very doomed area because there's not much going on there. There was a camp back in the 20s and 30s. It was, a, it was an Armenian camp. And then uh, by 1948, it became a Palestinian camp. And then in, up until 75, 76, in January, February of 1976, it was burned down to the ground by the Christian uh, phalangist militia, uh, a right-wing militia, the conservative camp. And some people say that it was about 15 people killed in, in, in less than two weeks. It was quite a horrible thing. And, um, and I was told that the broker, the broker I was sent to, was in fact the man who was responsible of the security uh, of that region, uh, representing the Falangist party. So, apparently he was the man behind the operation. And when I first met him, the broker of the piece of land of the first project I built, he told me, you want a piece of land in Carantina? Perfect. I know it like the palm of my hands. I cleaned it up in 1976. So that's how my, my career started. I was, not, I was not a builder of museums. Uh, at that point in time, the broker was finished politically, so we're still living in the past. And I must admit that the first two, three weeks of negotiations, I spent a lot of time with this guy that I didn't agree with politically. We didn't share political views. But uh, I, must, I must confess, I was very impressed by the man who had a lot of charisma, still living in the past. So the broker takes me to the landowner, who's also a problematic figure. The landowner is, in fact, the nephew of the commander of what was called at the time the South, uh, South, South Lebanese Army. Now, the South Lebanese Army collaborated with the enemy, with the Israelis, in the so-called security zone by the Israeli border. So, they had their share of, of odd uh, things uh, in, our, in our very tortured political history. But uh, the nephew, who is the landowner, has also quite a shady past, and problematic past. He was uh, the in-between guy, of a very important uh, arms deal that happened at some point in the early 90s when the local militias had to disarm and you were igniting your own wars here in the Balkans. So apparently there was a big arms deal, some say of a few hundred million dollars, that last deal, of which the landowner was the broker. And it also, it's been said that this, uh, the landowner uh, did not relay the money back. He kept the money and went to uh, South America to Brazil, more specifically to Sao Paulo, and vanished. And in the meantime, sent money to his brothers who were purchasing properties uh, in Lebanon. And one of the properties they, put, they purchased was the site on which we built our nightclub. So this puts you a little bit in the mood of, uh, of my early days, of my, my first uh, building. Uh, it, it was quite problematic. What you see here, the circular thing, is our site. And there's something very odd about this picture, because if you look at the bottom part of the screen, you see a very dense fabric, and this is part of Beirut, then you've got this major boulevard, and then beyond that, which is supposed to be the literal side, is a very scarce fabric. 
So on the fabric, on the map, you can read already a trauma. There is a very visible scar of uh, the history of the quarantine, which is quite problematic. Yet it's a very, very exposed site on a, very, on a major highway where everyone puts huge billboards and want to appear. And what we've done is exactly the contrary. We've built a club uh, which is only 70 centimeters off the ground, so we pushed it into the ground, and we've built this circular uh, carousel that the cars drive around. Uh, and, and what happens is that during the day, the club is completely invisible. So you drive by during the day, and the club is not there. And I thought that its absence, the fact that it was not visible, in fact made it even more visible. It was about preserving the void, while everything around us was extremely dense. Huh? The void sometimes, the disappearance of matter can make you, if anything, more visible. So this is it during the day, when the animal is asleep, and then it wakes up at night. And when it wakes up at night, its roof opens, so part of its uh, roof recedes uh, by slides, and then there's this big uh, flip-up panel, of which the under face has reflective mirrors. And what happens is that at night, because the club is extremely loud, and we were there because we could make a lot of noise, because nobody lives in the quarantine, because it stinks, in the quarantine is the slaughterhouses, is the garbage company, is uh, the tanneries, so everything that stinks, nobody wants to be there, except us. So we can make a lot of noise, so we open up the, the roof, and that flip-up panel makes the noise go out, it reflects it out into the, the, into the parking lot, and when the club gets extremely crowded, it's just, it's in the parking that it happens. But it also reflects some of the flickering lights and the, the warmth of the light of the life below. My office is nearby, because I like the quarantine, I have something with problematic areas, and sometimes I work very late at night, and it's, it's interesting, at 3, 4 in the morning, I hear boom, the base, the life that comes out of that, of that hole, of that ground. And I think it's, it's a very interesting thing, because I think we've brought life uh, to an area that is still extremely problematic. Uh, the Western press didn't see it that way. They called me the bad boy who dances on graves and all sorts of bullshit. This was a temporary building. It was supposed to disappear five years down the road. It's almost 20 years now. It's still alive and kicking, if anything, more than, uh, than when, we, when we built it. My son, who is with us tonight, is 17, he's not allowed to be there. But when I built this club, uh, he was even born. And his, 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 his number one thing on his agenda is to make it to that club. <laughs> so, 20 years later, as so you see here, the building is, is, is black because it was, uh, it was built in steel that we did not treat. So it, it looked uh, out of the mill, very fresh. 20 years later, uh, the steel is completely, completely rusted, but you see, the roof still works perfectly fine. And uh, the place is still extremely crowded. Uh, very, very crowded. I still go there every once in a while, but uh, I'm, I'm getting old. Uh, it be it's become an after-hours club. That's that, 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 the, the underside of the flip-up panel, and it's great what you can do with, with cheap materials. This is plexiglass, cheap plexiglass, and the fact that it's cheap makes it undulate and it gives you a very sort of surreal um, image, particularly at night of the, of the lights that, uh, of the cars that are driving by the highway. So it's a very disco-like flickering thing. <clears throat> and then if you're, if you're strong enough to stay up, uh, the image to the right, hmm? at 7, 8 in the morning, this is the kind of stuff you see happening. You see the, the lady in the white dress with her hand in her crotch, the other one leaving with a guy who probably, she'll probably regret that. Another guy passed out on the, on the roof. I found that image on the internet, I didn't take it, and the bouncer doesn't care. So that, that's how I started. I'm not a builder of museums, I'm a builder of places of debauchery. That's the label that still sticks to me 20 years later. But I started that club, uh, I didn't have an office, I was working on my own. I drew every single bolt of it. I drew every single drawing. I look back at these drawings, I'm impressed because I can't draw anymore. This is what happens when you grow. Uh, I, I modeled it with very primitive 3D modeling uh, 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 programs um, and that crashed all the time, but down to the last bolt it was all modeled in 3D because <clears throat> no contractor wanted to build this thing. They thought that I should go back to school. In fact, if you look very closely at this building, everything is wrong about it in terms of the construction standards. And I'm going to stop here for a second because this building, I was spoiled. I was spoiled because I've never worked in an architecture office. I was spoiled because I've never learned the trade. But I'm a builder, I'm, I'm someone who works with his hands. 
since I was a young kid. Uh, I ended up building this thing with a garbage truck constructor, you know, the garbage compactors and trucks. For him, it was a piece of uh, a piece of cake. It was very easy. In fact, the whole roof structure cost us fifty-seven thousand dollars, including the pistons I bought myself in France for eight thousand euros. So, um, eight thousand dollars at the time. So uh, we, we built this thing against all odds in terms of the construction industry, with very little money. There was no contractor, so I was contractor. I was drawing at night, building during the day for six months. I got it all built in six months with very little money. And it's interesting because the contractors were completely wrong. It worked. 20 years later, it was only supposed to last five years. We still open and close the roof at how many nights, ever many times a night. It still works. It never leaked a single drop of water. In fact, we had leaks of water in the concrete underground walls because of the waterproofing membrane that probably comes from China. So, the new contractors and contracting, the contracting industry. You know? uh, it's all about really trying to tie back alliances with local, with local artisans, you know? the last few survivors. And I think this is how we produce me. This is me, so just to give you some scale, that black thing in the parking lot. Another, another of my heroes I want to talk about is the Prime Minister. Some of you might know him. Rafid Hariri, uh, like him or not, was behind a very big project, of which I was very critical back in the early 90s. But if there's one big major figure of the post-war period in Lebanon, it's definitely Rafid Hariri, for the good and the bad. Standing here on the roof of my club, uh, right before a very heated debate I had with him, at the end of which he told me, uh, you have a problem, my son, you're still living in the war. That was in 2000. Rafil Hariri was assassinated on February 14, 2005, with a charge, an explosive charge of the equivalent of 1,400 kilos of TNT. And then after that, there was a big uh, international tribunal, which is still going today at the cost of $80 million a year. Um, and because of his, assass his assassination, this year is pulled out of Lebanon. Rafil Hariri was an important figure and a very problematic one because Rafil Hariri was at the same time a tycoon, an entrepreneur, a businessman, the protégé of the, of the Saudi king, very respected by all, politicals, all political figures around the planet, a very close friend of Jacques Chirac. But he was also at the same time the prime minister of many successive governments, post-war governments. And he was also the figure behind the reconstruction of the center of Beirut, which was in no man's land for 15 years between 1975 and 1990. Uh, he created a company, a private, a private company called Solidaire, that expropriated the whole city center. And he came up with a formula to rebuild it, a very interesting formula, very problematic one. Those are the kind of pictures you saw of Beirut back in 1990, right after the conflict stopped. It was a, it was a big no man's land. And at the time, I was, a, I was, a, I was a, 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 a master's student at Harvard University, and I was kind of forced by a great professor of mine, who's called Lebius Woods. Some of you might know him because he was also very interested in the region. While he forced me to work on Beirut, he was working on Zagreb. Uh, he was very interested by issues of war and architecture. And I was kind of forced into that subject. It was the first time I had worked on Beirut. And at the time, I believed that uh, um, as the, the private company Solidaire was coming in and wiping out most of the cadavers, the old buildings that were uh, non-salvageable, uh, I thought that there was something that needed to be done. The city needed to go through a healing period. So we took, uh, we took uh, as a case study, a very generic banal ruin that I built out of concrete, and we simulated this exercise that I called Evolving Scars. It was about scarring the city, acknowledging the fact that these cadavers had to go, that we should not develop a fetishism of uh, war and architecture and the aesthetics of war, so these had to go, but we had to replace the memory of the matter, the matter, with another kind of memory, a memory we would collect from the citizens or those who had lived uh, this particular building. So we've built a, a transparent membrane around it, and the void in between the two layers of the membrane was equivalent in cubic meters to the matter we needed to demolish. And we tried to develop a formula by which uh, the amount of matter destructed or demolished and sucked and distributed in the periphery, in the membrane, would be a result of the uh, data that is being uh, um, recorded by the memory collector. So here there was a, an attempt to try to establish a relationship between uh, the immaterial memory that was being stocked 
and the material memory that was being demolished. And as you see here, the machine is operating. It is slowly demolishing and crushing uh, the ruin as uh, the ashes of the building are spread around the transparent periphery. You see it here operating and you see it here right before the end. So the outer uh, peripheral membrane is almost, is almost full. Uh, the ruin is almost completely demolished and uh, the memory collector has almost reached its point of saturation. And at that point, the memory collector starts digging its hole into the ground and the whole structure will implode. Uh, and I call this uh, the end of the scarring period. Uh, the anecdote was that Beirut would have its seventh archaeological layer because we have six layers on the Beirut. This one would be immaterial at the image of its time. I was 21, 22 years old when I produced this project. Looking at, at it today is, I think it was very naive politically because at the time in the early 90s I thought that we were at the beginning of a reconstruction project. I thought that we were going to rebuild the nation, build a collective memory. Obviously this did not happen. But I look back at this project and I find it interesting on an experimental level in the sense that this was probably as far as I know with the little uh, very limited architectural culture I have, and proud of that. Uh, it was the first exercise, I think, that tried to make architecture out of the disappearance of matter, not the representation of the disappearance of matter, but in fact the literal disappearance of matter. We erect matter as architects, but here I tried to make an exercise by doing exactly the opposite. Uh, still in the entertainment, we'll, we'll, we'll jump back to the entertainment. My second project is called La Centrale, very much, uh, I think, influenced by evolving stars. Here I was uh, given a ruin, supposedly under historical protection, and the ruin under historical protection is very interesting what historians tell you to do, or those who are about preservation. You're supposed to keep the envelope of the building intact, you're supposed to rehabilitate it and make it look like it once looked supposedly in some kind of postcard, but what you do inside is not important. And what we had to do inside was obviously a very drastic change. We had to gut out uh, the building, literally build a new structure that would hold the, uh, the outer periphery or the facade in place by means of these temporary beams that you see around. It's a very surgical exercise. And I owe this concept, this concept to my structural engineer because he started doodling the, the surgical intervention that I thought was extremely interesting. And, and then I looked at him and I said, you just formulated the architectural concept. The architectural concept, history, is what we're making, is the violation of the ruin. What we're doing, in fact, was cutting out the old animal huh, and replacing it with another animal. So imagine I take you, I dig a hole in your head, I dig out everything from inside, I keep the skin in tension with temporary beams, I put another animal inside, and by the time I'm done, supposedly, they remove the beams and they, they do some kind of nice plastic surgery to make you look like you were a little kid or young or pretty. They apply some blush, usually a pastel color, and everybody's happy, the historians are. But I call this a falsification of history. We did not do that, obviously. We kept the beams in place. We went and worked again with local artisans. The guy who manufactured the circular beams uh, couldn't fit them in his, in his shop. His shop was so small. Huh? And uh, this was a fantastic construction site. I was there every day, I was building, I was working with my hands, with these people. That's the plan of our intervention. And if you see inside, there was one big table. And uh, around that one big table, there was 45 to 50 people you could seat. And in the middle of the, of the big table, if you look closely, you see there's an H shape here. It, it was a circuit in which the waiters used to walk. So the waiters were trapped inside the table. They were prisoners of the table. Their only escape from the table was the staircase that took them back uh, down to the hall where they belong in the kitchen. And if you look even closer at the section, you see here that they were standing on a plane that was about 40 centimeters lower than the plane you were seated at, so that they were always lower. And you would look down at them and they would look up to you. So it was very politically incorrect. It was a very pretentious space. It was not about eating anymore. It was about something else. It was my revenge against the public space that did not happen, or my kind of uh, take on this uh, marvelous society that was living in marvelous denial, this post-war society that was living in marvelous denial that I'm part of. So that's the bar upstairs that we placed the roof in that tubular circular structure. And this is a close look at the facade after we were done. So you see here uh, the beams that we've kept, and you see secondary frames in which there is um, wire, 
that protects the old um, plaster that is slowly, uh, slowly but surely decomposing, and I call this the, uh, the poetry of decay. That's the bar upstairs, which is also a convertible structure. So you see the building now with the bar closed, with the roof closed, and you see it open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. See, it works. Also the work of great artisans. This is it inside. What you see in front of the plates are not microphones. They are pilot lamps that light up the plate. They become reflectors, so people looked at each other, but they couldn't talk to each other. After that, I became the entertainment architect hmm? uh, because everything we were doing was was working very, very, very uh, was working even financially for the, those who were operating it. Uh, this is called Yabani. It's a very odd proposal. It is a, a, a sort of a monument in which there is just a stupid sushi bar downstairs, but it's built in a very problematic area on the demarcation line, the Damascus Road that separates East from West Beirut. So I was always brought to these problematic sites, sites uh, that were still under comparisons. And I'm asked to build in the middle of ruins, right next to us, the, buildings you see, the building you see here, was still squatted by refugees who were living off very low wages, $150 a month, without handrails, without uh, windows, without running water. Yet next door you could buy sushi at $100 a pop. So there was something completely immoral about this. Any serious architect would have run away and not contributed to this uh, absurdity. But this is Beirut, and we chose to celebrate it, not cynically, I hate cynical people, but we, 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 we chose to, uh, to try to produce meaning out of this. Uh, this is it at night, so you see it's not photoshopped. The building next door was really living its life, while downstairs was a completely different reality. If you look at the plan, in the center of it is this circular thing, which was a circular room that moved up and down, up to the street level, where uh, there was a huge circular reception. You were put in a vitrine, um, exhibited to the city, and then whoosh, sucked into the building, and then you landed in the center of the bar, smacked in the middle of the bar, and the, the plan was drawn with the precision of a Swiss watch. In all these three projects I showed you, we were in complete control of everything, down to the ashtray. We bought nothing from the building industry, not even a window profile. Everything was built uh, locally, if in fact in situ. Uh, the lights, uh, the door handles, uh, the ashtrays, the chairs, everything. With an incredible precision, because every single instrument was at the service of this reality we were constructing. So I call them apparatuses, instruments. I don't call this architecture. I call them instruments in the service of a reality that we are building and constructing ourselves. When you were downstairs, you only contact with the outside world, with the sky, and nothing but the sky, for those who believe in God. But when you were inside, uh, you could enjoy your, your, your expensive sushi meal in complete denial of what's happening literally behind the wall, the other realities, the refugees. Another figure I want to, want to talk about is that was a very an important leap in my career was moving from all three projects you saw. In fact, the six first projects I built were temporary projects. They were projects that had a limited lifespan. So uh, I knew before I conceived of them that they, they were going to be bulldozed by contract because they were all located in problematic zones in areas that had not reached their real estate maturity. So people were renting us a piece of land for a limited amount of time that we were not exploiting fully. And then a few years later, they were hoping that the real estate situation would catch up. They would get us out of there and build permanent buildings that exploit fully the site. Uh, so the first person who gave me a permanent project was the, uh, the young entrepreneur. And the young entrepreneur came to me. His first project, in fact, was located right next to Central. So you see, this is Central. And right behind it, I always operate, operate my neighborhoods, right behind it was my first permanent building. A very tough exercise, a very big slap in the face I got early on before we started because the young entrepreneur comes to me and tells me we're going to develop a Shell and Core project. A Shell and Core project is literally uh, the developer and the architect design and build the shell of the building it's, it, and its envelope and the cores, the common areas. And they leave as little as possible in the exploitable spaces. This is a uh, 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 a very small niche, a high-end niche in the real estate uh, developers market where they basically sell apartments to people who have a lot of money and they come in with their own decorators 
who make more sense, are more intelligent and more sensitive than the bastard that I am. So the developer tells me, I want no trace of you inside. You have to vanish and disappear. Imagine the difficulty for someone who had built six temporary projects of which he had complete control of, down to the last bolt, down to the last ashtray. We were in complete control of our work. And then suddenly, for the permanent building, the developer tells me, you get out of there. You have to leave no trace of your passage. So I decided, because I'm a masochist, that I was going to construct meaning out of that. So the first thing we've done is uh, we've decided not to draw the envelope. We took the building law, and we've applied to the last cubic centimeter the maximum volume we could apply on this site. So number one, the morphology of the building was not me. And then we took the shell and core concept to its, uh, to its extreme. We built a structural shell and a structural core in such a way that there was no trace, no structure inside the plants, none, so that anyone could come in and do whatever they wanted inside. We had on the party walls, the blind walls, continuous shafts, in such a way that they could put their bathrooms, their, their kitchens, anywhere they wanted, they could plug in their mechanical systems uh, into these shafts, and uh, we would leave the territory completely empty for future architects. It's very interesting because the seven different interior architects for the seven different apartments came to me and then they asked me for elevations. And I said, I'm not giving you elevations. You draw your plans, you do your interior elevations and then we project them on the outside. And that's what happens. This is why the, the windows are not aligned and if you look closely at the photos, you will see that it's completely discontinuous. See, this is not because I tried to look cute or you know it was very uh, trendy at the time to do sort of stupid discontinuous uh, figures. It was not about that, because it is building uh, really evolved uh, organically. So I took the interior elevations and projected them to the outside. So I recap the three basic prerogatives of an architect. Drawing the morphology, I did not do. The law did. Drawing the plans, I did not do. I left no trace even of the structure inside. Drawing the elevations, I did not do. Uh, the seven interior architects did it for me. Yet, I look at this building and I think uh, I like it. It's interesting because you can produce architecture without drawing. Huh? And it was in this voluntary uh, sort of a masochistic exercise whereby, because of the very sour reality uh, that I completely adopted and tried to construct meaning out of, uh, we were able to do architecture without, without drawing the morphology of the building, without designing any plans, without designing any elevations. We did a lot of work with the young entrepreneur. This is another project that has nothing to do with the reality I showed you right before. Beirut is great because it allows you to contradict yourself from one street corner to the other. This is why I like my local heroes. My local heroes, uh, the title of this book, which goes through 18 different characters, it allows you to build very contradictory realities in your different relationships with these different, with these different people without really any care of context in the conventional sense of the term. And this is when you become contextual. You become contextual when you are obsessed with the specificity of the situation, when you are no longer worrying about the cliches of context, these consensual definitions, this dangerous simplification of history. You build context by, a, by an obsessive, carnal relationship with the people that make this project possible. Uh, in this situation, we were at war with the, uh, with the typologies of the developers at the time, which consist of very deep slabs with central um, cores in the middle, I'm sure you have a lot of those. So you get out of the elevator in the Mediterranean country at noon on the 15th of August. You have to turn on the light to put your key into your door. I think that's a crime. That's a very bad interpretation of, of modernism. So what we've done here are apartments that allow you to go from any room to any other room in your house without ever walking inside if you felt like it. So follow my cursor. The parents wake up in the morning, they walk out on the balcony, they go down around the olive tree into the kitchen, uh, they grab a coffee, they go into the living room, take the newspaper and then go down and see their kids without ever walking inside. And that's the end of it. But that's a political act. Because it produces another kind of fabric, another kind of social fabric in the city. One that doesn't look at the outside as some kind of hostile territory. It's very interesting. Now, most people glaze their balconies in these very deep slabs as if the outside was hostile territory. They produce a bad fabric a bad social fabric, we are at war with them and we've tried to produce a positive fabric, one that reconciles you with your environment and with the city. 
And that's the end of it. And it's a very honest facade that reflects the split section and the circuit around the apartments. That's me walking on my balcony. That's me standing on my balcony. So that's the sensitive part of me. And then there is uh, more of the entertainment that comes back and follows you. The Arnold brother wants to go into my office with a very problematic side, but wants to do high-end residential developments. These people want to make money, you have to understand this. Hmm? There's nothing wrong with that. And I go look at the site and realize it's, it's a very problematic area, we can't build anything there. He comes back to me and tells me, we're going to build a development for bachelors. A development where there will be no families, no kids, no mates, no school buses, none of that. Just playboys, uh, you know, uh, uh, bachelors, people who party, those who go to your clubs. And in order to do that, so he had to force me into bringing the car into the apartment. And look at the plan, the car is quite big. I mean, I'm not the first guy to do uh, a development where you can drive the car up into the building. But here, it's taken up by an elevator and the car is quite big relative to the plan and particularly relative to the apartments that are not that huge. And the idea was that these people can drive their cars, uh, you are your car of course, what's rendered here is a, is a, is a, is a vintage uh, Porsche 911. So you're at the club and if you're lucky you come back home in your car into your living room and if you're very lucky you don't make it up to the bedroom, you stay in your car if your company is good. And we built this, but in fact, moving the car into the building was so important that it ended up shaping the building, uh, which became an instrument of pleasure, in a way. And this is it, it's built, it operates, no families, no kids, no school buses, only playboys and playgirls. And that's my motorbike in the elevator that moves the car up. This is me riding into the building inside one of the apartments. This is, uh, this is the vintage uh, 911 in one of the apartments. So you see, some of the entertainment sort of followed me uh, into the residential projects. Ah, the son of the president, who's a, uh, a squash champion, very good, very good uh, squash player, uh, gave me a commission which was uh, the tallest building at the time I had ever built in Beirut, finished not long ago. I love this building because you can see already the tortured relationship I had with the son of the president. Uh, as we were moving up, they were changing, surrendering to clients' changes and needs, and what was initially a very stark and very clean, tall structure ended up being extremely tortured. And at some point, I gave up and I said, we're going to make an ugly building. I call it the hunchback. Mm -hmm. And we don't care because it's come, it comes out of bad soil, and that's good. Huh? Architecture should not be pretty anymore. Uh, we shouldn't care about our syntax. Yet, I think it stands, uh, and if you ever go to Beirut, it's a very visible building. It's smack at the northern uh, exit of the city, right in front of the port. And it stands very proudly in front of the port as some kind of, uh, as some kind of uh, sentinel. And uh, look, look, you see it here. Obviously, these buildings at the top are inhabited by people who have a lot of means, so it gets extremely decadent. But all, most of these buildings have heads. This is Beirut, this is where I come from. It's a catastrophic territory. I think you guys are going towards that too. Unregulated territory because, because the state is bankrupt. And with a state that is bankrupt, incompetent and corrupt, in Beirut, I guess you have the same problem here, uh, there are no mechanisms uh, of regulating the city. And it creates catastrophic fabric. Uh, very ugly for those who like Rome or Paris. But it stinks, yet uh, some things that stink can be good sometimes. Uh, and problematic and very sour, but it doesn't matter. And that's where I choose to live. So my house is in fact built around a huge window, which is 6 meters by 12, aiming south, straight at the enemy, whether it's Hezbollah or Tzahal, who knows. And, uh, and right on top of that, we have uh, two wonderful light fixtures that light up the roof. And I'm very proud to say that I have the, um, the highest pedestrian bridge overlooking the city, crossing in the middle of that frame that is 6 by 12, around which I built my house, with the help of a lot of good, very good artisans. This is the bridge again, and, and that's the pool. A sort of a very decadent posture that allows me to float above the city. I know that does not sound very politically correct either. When we finished the building, uh, I had the secret services of the army who came up to inspect what these things were because they thought 
they were they had something military about them. One of the tenants in the building uh, uh, was very upset because he told me in 2006 during our last war with Israel uh, that Sahel planes ended up bombing some of the well uh, well uh, drilling uh, uh, trucks, and that uh, he was absolutely sure in the next war we would be bombed by the Israeli planes. I told him he was stupid and that the Israeli pilots were in fact much, much smarter than he thought. They probably knew what kind of underwear he wears and they had nothing to worry about and in case they bombed us, I would, I would be a victim of my own architecture. What a nice way to run my life. Um, so that's that building. We're doing a lot of residential work in very problematic areas. Uh, I'll try to go as quickly as I can around this building which is about to be completed built in a very problematic site, again, uh, it has about 400 meters of periphery out of which only five and a half meters cross public land. It means that on the remaining 390 something meters, I could have a neighbor that comes and in the absence of any master plan or any regulating uh, uh, mechanism, he can come and, and build a blind wall that turns his back to me. So any other wise architect would have retracted into the site built a tower and ensured enough setback within his own site while turning his back to the neighbors. I did exactly the opposite because that's the story of Beirut. The story of Beirut is a story of a fabric that evolved with no mechanisms that regulates it. And I played the game that in fact takes advantage of the situation as around us is mainly now agricultural land. So I basically elongated the plan, stretched it to the whole periphery so that it's as elongated as possible and opened it up on the whole periphery and then started setting back as I went up to ensure enough light and air, whatever happens around me. But I helped my neighbors, I opened my arms to my neighbors, and then I did that very scientifically with no care of uh, what it would look like. And it turns out like this, it looks like a very, uh, very brutal piece, but yet it's the most tender gesture one could do. It basically retracted, never gave its back to any of the periphery, and it gave me extremely interesting slabs that I would have never drawn on my own site if it was not problematic. See, I love problematic situations. These are apartments now. Uh, this is under construction. It's almost finished. And, uh, and you can imagine the kind of apartments that have terraces that hug the neighbors and open up their arms all around. And, and instead of using regular handrails, I built a bar on the whole periphery of the apartment so you can have coffee and talk to your neighbor next door. See, I'm very naive. I believe that you can still reconcile with, with the neighbors you don't choose. The man overseas is another one of my heroes uh, who's also vanished in Sao Paulo. I forgot to tell you that the landowner, the guy who had uh, not relayed the money back to the Lebanese forces, the few hundred million dollars, ended up getting killed in 2002 in Sao Paulo, mafia style, seven bullets in the head. Yeah. But uh, this is another guy that uh, I adored. Uh, he also disappeared two years ago uh, and vanished in Brazil. We don't know if he's still around or not, but it doesn't matter because these brothers, these people always have brothers who love them, uh, continued the project with us. Initially, it was supposed to be the wildest hotel on the planet. We had a flying pool, we had a flying bar. I don't ask me what it is because I don't believe it, but it was happening. But after the man overseas took off, we had to change the plans. We had to make it a bit more subdued, so we turned what we had already started pouring in concrete, we turned it from a hotel to uh, 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 a sort of residential, high-end residential building. I call those fortresses because the more people have money, the more they sort of... So here I surrendered to the fortress. Uh, they're small apartments, but very high-end. It's a building that's going to be over 150 meters high, so it'll be one of the tallest buildings in Beirut. And we've, you know, a few of the moving uh, apparatuses remain on the facade, except that the main one is a sentinel. It's a flying sentinel. It's, it's the guard, basically, is lifted up by a crane at night and lights up the whole site and can see with his own, his own eyes, not only with cameras, although he has a lot of screens inside in the cockpit of what looks like an Apache helicopter, he can see everything going around so he can, he can make sure everything is, everything is secure. Uh, he, he, he is flying here, you can see him flying and then, and then during the day it comes back to rest and becomes the entrance gate of the building that controls the vehicular circulation in and out of the building. Uh, this is this is under construction. We will be done with pouring the concrete. We will reach 150 meters by September. So this is happening. Uh, the corporate mogul. We are 40 minutes down the road, so I'll skip the corporate mogul, who is a fantastic figure also uh, in, a, in a very improper project. But because it didn't happen, 
uh, I will skip it. Uh, the banker, uh, very quickly, the banker with whom I built uh, also a very long-term relationship. We've been working with him for 12 years. I did a lot of work with banks. It tells you very much where I come from. I've never done any public buildings, unfortunately, because there are no public buildings where I come from. The state is corrupt to the bone, incompetent, and, uh, and, and bankrupt. So you have to work with the private sector. And sometimes you find very interesting people. The banker, I built his mountain house for him, built around a few experiences of pleasure we've built together. It has 52 engines in its roof, built thanks to my collaboration with local artisans uh, who, uh, who built this very complex machine. See, uh, the roof also slides open. Uh, it has a balcony that moves up and down. See, it goes up and down. The balcony, boom, 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 uh, and it resists the snow because this is built at 1800 meters of altitude. A lot of houses were very damaged two years ago with heavy storms. There was not a single drop of water thanks to my artisans. We built a lot up in the mountains because we have mountains in Lebanon. This is a small project built at over 2000 meters of altitude. Altitude, two small twin villas for two brothers initially. A uh, very simple facade, it's an inclined plateau. Uh, that you walk up, almost like a cigarette, and you go all the way up, and then there's a pool that allows you to swim uh, with a 360 degree views over, over the mountains, the peaks of Mount Lebanon. So its facade, its, its, its southern facade, is built around a very simple expression of pleasure, going and floating above the mountain like a bird. And then the northern facade is completely open, but I won't show you that because it's banal. Um, the German developer. 42 minutes, we'll skip it. Uh, Santa Cesarea, Italy, Italy our, biggest, our biggest project, uh, but not built. Uh, one and a half square kilometers, I will stop, I will, I will, speak, I will skip that too. I will skip the man with the bow tie, that's in Kuwait. We're not going to talk about Kuwait tonight. It was a super mall, the Formula One of malls. But uh, I'll skip that. <clears throat> the son of the dictator. This one I can't miss. The Son of the Dictator was right before 2011. I guess you guessed who the dictator was. So I worked with his son, who uh, at the time they had a surplus of $40 billion after they had spent their money in casinos, Lamborghinis, and, and, and very expensive ladies in Geneva. Um, and uh, and uh, they wanted to do five pilot projects uh, one of them was supposed to be the Gate of Africa, so we produced uh, in a very short period of time a concept for them in near the town of Seba. Seba was the first town that uh, went ahead and, 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 and uh, supported the King of the Kings in his revolution over 40 years ago. So he wanted to give this back to the city of Seba, which mainly mainly gives off uh, of the maintenance of oil wells. So you see, this is Seba inside, contained inside the ring, and they came to me and they told me, you have to build something here. And I said, where here? They just kept on pointing at the Google, uh, at the Google Earth picture with their finger, and I kept asking for site limits. There were no site limits. They basically owned all of the territory. And with this absence of site limits, with the absence of any kind of specificity to the territory, I thought that, well, if I put a straight line going north to south, pointing towards Europe and, and in Africa in the other direction, uh, the 750,000 square meters I was to build, I can build in one single level in a project that would be 100 meters wide by uh, seven and a half kilometers. And that's what we did. Uh, and it would cross along its path all sorts of things, whether it's agricultural land, infrastructure, or whatever. It would, and it would always, would always be in contact with, uh, with its limit, with its periphery, which I thought would be extremely interesting. And it would be basically a play of, of topography, sort of a land art project where uh, nothing is vertical. It would make Dubai look stupid with its 700 meters high uh, tower because this would be 10 times longer except horizontally. It would even make maybe the wall of China look stupid. Um, but obviously uh, this, the Arab Spring came and, 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 and then the dictator was gone along with his son. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, Arab modernity is very interesting to look at what uh, us Arabs have produced. Our relationship with modernity is very problematic. Although we've had our glorious 30 years when our republics were young, 
uh, where we produced local modern architects, but that was mainly in Baghdad, Cairo, uh, Beirut, maybe Damascus. Uh, but then, with the failure of the nation state, uh, it's very interesting to see how modernity sort of failed, modernism failed, hand in hand, hand, in hand with, with the nations, and as the nation state went bankrupt, the modern project went bankrupt, hand in hand. There's something very interesting about that. It was a subject of our intervention at the Venice Biennale in 2014, but architects were very interested about anything that was political. They loved the archives, the data, the cute graphics that uh, make you swallow that data very quickly as you're sitting on your throne taking a dump. Uh, that was what the 2014 Biennale was. Uh, but anyway, back to our modernity. This is, uh, this is Bahrain. No? And you can see the sort of catastrophes. There are mainly imports from the Anglo-Saxon world. Hmm? These architects are either American, Canadian, South African, uh, Australian, whatever. They speak English, mostly. This is Kuwait, with a very stupid tower by SOM, 400 meters long, the highest concrete structure in the world. But uh, twists. <laughs> what? I don't know. Look at this idiot who twists right next door. It's, it's all about twisting. Hmm? This is the modernity we import, we buy. We buy modernity, we no longer produce it. And then we produce all sort of stupid, idiotic symbols, such as this one in Dubai, the most pathetic city on earth. Uh, look at this, look at this very closely, because as you zoom in, this is that. That is this. Huh? That's, that's the Arab modern city today. Catastrophic. When you can no longer produce, contribute to modernity, it's extremely dangerous, both politically, socially, culturally, whatever you call it. We've worked in Saudi Arabia. This is a very erotic project. It's called Surra Manra, Pleasure to Those Who See. I've designed this for a very, very adorable princess. It was a building that was only for women, so men could not be in that building. Uh, obviously, it is this thing. It's at the tip of the block, uh, on a very important site, at the foot of Bojel Mamlaka, this stupid tower that looks like a bottle opener that you've probably seen. Um, so, because it's 7,500 square meters of space that men could not visit, I, and this building could not have any windows, I pushed the building into the ground, and because the ladies cannot drive, and they're driven, they basically arrive on this big uh, carpet of uh, glass blocks that are translucent, they're dropped off by their chauffeurs, and then they go into this, uh, well, before they go into this, there are elevators that move up, from the ground, and they are piloted by this little libellude, this little insect, inside of which there's an elevator operator. So when he sees the car arrive, he pushes the elevator up, and then the elevator that is seven meters high uh, comes up, the door opens, the lady comes in, into the elevator, the door is closed, she can remove her, her veil, go down, and be practically naked downstairs, because there are only women, and they can pamper themselves downstairs, and you can imagine how erotic this is. And you can imagine how erotic it is for the stupid male that walk on the, on the uh, translucent surface above as they crawl above that veil trying to look in. They cannot see, yet they are seen by the ladies below because as they walk on the translucent surface, they can be perceived from under. So those who are above end up being stupid and those who are under, in fact, are far more in control. We did all sorts of fantasies in the Arab world. This is an inhabitable suspended topography um, where basically the building has no facade, you land and you walk on the, uh, on the gardens into your houses. But that didn't happen because people in Dubai are very stupid. Um, the art collector, the art collector, who cares about art? But this is, this is a highway project where I built this structure that served nothing but to scream on a highway, which would give a lesson to Robert Venturi and learning from Las Vegas. Our boulevards have lost, uh, have completely killed architecture in the sense that the, building, uh, the buildings that were built to be inhabited are now completely uh, covered by billboards because their vertical facades have become more, uh, more expensive than the horizontal floor plates inside. So my client, who was very smart, uh, asked me to shout on the highway when we developed this apparatus that had a big screen that we transmitted what was happening in the superstore inside. Um, an ATM machine, so on and so forth. It yelled on the highway, and then years later, he comes to me as he became an art collector and asks me to build his art foundation. And I was not very interested in art, uh, or the foundation, or museums in general. 
I was far more interested in his retail operation because he's a, he's a big retail tycoon. He represents uh, Christian Vior, Yves Saint Laurent, Prada, you, you name it. So I thought his relationship with, with fashion and retail was far more interesting. And in fact, it would make me give some interest to art. So what I've asked him to do is to give me only the seven meters that are on the facade. And we would do with that uh, basically a sandwich of three layers, the car and the drop off of the works. And then a huge frame, which was 110 meters by, I can't remember how high, which was big, basically the biggest stretched canvas in the world. And we didn't know, and we had a big argument about this, whether this should be an artwork that should be commissioned, commissioned to a famous artist, or whether it should just be uh, a big Prada advertisement. And I thought the big Prada advertisement could be as much art, if not more, uh, than the stupid art that uh, you know, the cocky, pretentious artist would produce, or maybe he could produce a Prada billboard. Um, above it was the longest bar in the world, 110 meters long, facing the highway and facing the sea on the other side. Uh, I have remained very true to this concept as he asked me to make uh, succession after succession, which I refused to make. So he ended up going to, what's his name? Ah, David Ajay. David Ajay who produced a very cute building, of course. Banks, uh, this, this very quickly, this is a bank located, uh, uh, it was a prototype pavilion we did for a bank for which we were designing the architectural identity, but again, I got stuck to the specific con context here, very close to the Syrian border, prior to the Syrians pulling out in 2005, and this building basically turns its spot to Damascus and faces Beirut, because there was something very interesting at the time, as we were under complete control politically by the Syrians, our stupid politicians would drive to Syria to get their orders. There was a far more interesting phenomenon happening the other way around. Cars were coming from Damascus with a lot of money in their plastic bags because there were no, no private banks in Syria and were very good at banking. So this building basically was a revenge towards Damascus. It turns its butt to the Assad regime. It was hidden behind its big carcass and had a mouth. And out of the mouth that was pointing towards Beirut was an ATM machine that spit the money. So you see, even the ATM machine can be material for architecture. The galleries for whom I produce the cemetery of my works, uh, basically, what you see here is uh, the British ambassador hung by the balls and experiencing an eight minute tour of my home built works that start in my studio. And all the images and the videos that were produced were produced to be only perceived in this apparatus, but uh, you have to experience it. Uh, the curator for whom I built a military device, um, curator who once was the curator of the Venice Biennale uh, years ago. Uh, we were, I was part of a group show that he was curating and it was about the space of imprisonment and uh, I was much more interested in speed. So the person you see the far left, again, Firidio comes back, is the fastest man on earth. He's uh, sitting with a laptop on his lap and then this is called the regression of speed, the regression of the order of speed. We moved from uh, the speed of light to mechanical speed. This was, I think, the McLaren Formula 1 of that year. It was 2008. So the first regression is from electronic speed to mechanical speed. Then animal speed, the speed at which we traveled until the 19th century. And then lastly, uh, uh, imprisonment speed, or the speed of detention, for which we built a, a, a drone, uh, a device that was conceived to exchange prisoner of wars. And it was built around an American lexicon of, of, um, of, of uh, defense terms. Very seriously, it functions. We've tested it. I was also called by the uh, Maxi Museum to produce a piece uh, for the opening of the museum back in 2010 under the category of, um, of uh, geopolitics. This is where I'm imprisoned. So we, we sort of mapped a very uh, wild tour of Beirut, a sensational tour of Beirut, through sites that were fetishized after the war. And after we, after we mapped that, we tried to materialize what it would look like to connect these. We used uh, uh, rails that look like roller coaster rails. This is looking at them from the Murr Tower. And the idea was that you could basically come in and out of the Holiday Inn Hotel in a split second, just like when you flip through the books of Kool House, and boom, you can consume very quickly. And, uh, and then we, we, we imagined that the, um, the apparatus you would use to travel uh, we would, uh, we would build a capsule in which we would put the, the head of the tourist, this, this intellectual, uh, curious uh, tourist, we would put his head uh, where the detonator is, and then we built the damn thing. Uh, this is it, on our way into the office. We rolled it around the city, and then we, we built the rails in our, in our heads, 
and we've spread them around the city as a, as a last layer of the complete decadence of being, that can be consumed as an object of fantasy. Um, and we were arrested by the uh, secret services of the army. And three guys uh, were put in jail because of that, because they thought we were fabricating evidence for the Israelis. Uh, it was a Scott missile story at the time. Uh, the last, the last um, uh, hero I'm going to talk about is, is the doctor. The doctor who's, in fact, my brother, a very famous uh, reconstructive surgeon who's worked on all sorts of experimental um, uh, operations. Uh, but the one I'm going to talk about today dates back from 1986. At the time, I was a student uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, at the Rhode Island School of Design. He was at Brown. Brown University had just received experimental rats. Uh, they were rats that were stripped of their immunity. They had ten of them. My brother, who's uh, Lebanese by blood, stole one of the rats and replaced it with a normal rat that he put back in the lab. And the idea was that him and a colleague of his were going to work on a very experimental, very important operation. Because these rats didn't have an immunity system, they could basically uh, plant a, a toe or a finger onto the rat, replace the leg by the toe or finger, and have the toe or the finger's uh, veins segregated by the rat. And the idea is to basically use these animals that are stripped from their immunity to basically irritate these vessels until the body is uh, in a stable enough condition to take back its member that it's lost. So you can imagine that uh, if you lose your leg, uh, uh, you, could, you could use a pig that is stripped of its immunity that would, you would basically irrigate uh, your leg's vessels uh, by the pig. And then, and then when you're fine enough to take your leg back uh, a day or a week later, we could take the leg off the pig and put it back in your place. And it was very serious. They were preparing for a very serious medical conference. And my task was to guard the rat and just guard the rat. So I spent about a week looking at this rat until they finally found a donor, a donor body in Massachusetts. They came and took the rat away. They came back a few hours later and the rat had a toe. Instead of the instead of the leg, and it was a very ugly toe. It was a, apparently a very old lady who was in her late 80s and had a very ugly uh, nail on her toe. It was disgusting. And I was looking at this rat, and I was paid 50 dollars a day to make sure that the rat is okay. While my brother was on call, calling me every every half an hour when he was out of operation. And then at some point, after a week of extreme tired, being very very tired, uh, not sleeping. At some point, he stops calling me because he's stuck in an operation that goes on for about six, seven hours, and unfortunately, I fell asleep. And I was woken up by a phone call six hours later, and my brother was asking me for like the hundredth time, uh, how is the rat doing? I turn around and I see the rat stuck in the corner. He had pushed, pushed, he or she, I don't know, had pushed, 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 all the way to the corner of the cage, which was transparent. He or she was very stupid because it was transparent, but because he didn't have a, a leg, he had a toe, he couldn't push back, and ended up asphyxiated and died. And my brother basically failed his operation because of me, and since then he thinks I'm a total idiot. And when I decided to go back to Beirut, years later, after graduating from Harvard, he was very proud of me, and when I told him I was going to go back to Beirut, he told me there's a say in Arabic, you're going to go back and act as a rooster on top of a garbage dump. I'll never forget that. Every time I, I get a, a slap in the face in Beirut, uh, and every time I face the situation of a third world citizen, I remember what my brother says, who's now a big daughter in the US. But then again, I, was, I became the mascot of the Johnny Walker campaign a few years ago. Uh, I was the, the man who walks, the man you see here. And I was on the 8 o'clock news every single day, 30 seconds clip, for one year. So I became extremely famous because of that. Uh, probably more famous than if I had gotten the Prisco Prize. And if you look very, very closely here, very closely, you will see that um, you will see that uh, the poster under me is Paris Hilton. So I'm 40 meters high above Paris Hilton. Not a lot of architects can say that. One hour and 15 seconds. Thank you very much.